Hello class. So this is our assignment for Tuesday. It is our independent learning. Today we're going to talk specifically about the heat transfer of convection, heat transfer between fluids on earth. Um, there is a Google form type assignment that you should be completing while watching this video. Um, you can find that Google form under the assignment in Google Classroom. So let's real quick run over those heat transfer methods. If you look at your notes, you should have written down last Thursday that Okay, so heat transfer. You should have written down there's three methods of heat transfer, right? We have convection, which we're talking about today. That's heat transfer using hot fluids, hot liquids to warm something up. And then you have conduction, which is heat transfer between two touching objects. This is a coffee cup with some hot coffee in it. If I physically touch it with my hand and my hand starts to get warm, that's an example of conduction. Last but not least, we have radiation, the third heat transfer. Radiation is when heat is transferred to an object without even touching it, without the other object touching it. For example, the sun. We feel the warmth of the sun every day, but we never have touched the sun. So looking specifically at, conve at convection, let's check it out. So I'm sure you all have seen lava lamps before, and lava lamps are a perfect example of convection. Have you ever wondered why the lava inside the lava lamp rises, why it falls, that is because of convection. So looking at this example of the lava lamp, the heat makes the lava rise because it becomes less dense and wants to float. When the lava cools down again, it becomes more dense and it sinks. So there's a little heater on the bottom of a lava lamp and it heats up the lava that's sitting at the bottom. Once that lava is heated up, it rises to the top forcing the lava that's cooled down at the top to then sink down to the bottom. So this is fluid movement due to heat differences. And we see that in our air as well. This creates a circular current and that's called a convection current. So we're gonna look at this video of a convection cell where instead of a lava lamp, he's using water to demonstrate how different temperature liquids move each other around. So let's check it out. So what we have here is a demonstration of how um, buoyancy generation in a, in a fluid can generate a circulation. And it, it has an analogy to the sea breeze that we're going to talk about in class. And so uh, we're just going to go ahead and, and describe what's in here. So right over here, we have a heater. And over here, we have a cold spot. Uh, this is water in there, and the uh, uh, staff at the prep room here have put some little aluminum particles into the fluid so that you can visualize what's happening. What you can see is that over the heater, you're generating some buoyancy. Uh, that's because the water is warming up, it's becoming less dense, and the water to the cold side of it is basically pushing in under it and uh, generating this circulation. You'll notice a number of interesting things about it. One of the things you notice is that where the buoyancy is being generated, you see a lot of small-scale structure. And that's very typical for generating buoyancy in a fluid. So it's, these are basically like boundary layer eddies. So the narrator starts talking about some higher-up science that we don't need to worry about at all. What I want you to learn from this video is this heater at the bottom of the tank is heating up that liquid, right? And we can see in the video that as the liquid is heating up, it is rising. So let's just press and play again. Fluid can, can generate, generate a circulation. Can you mute him? All right, wait one second. Okay, so once he puts the heater in, 
we can see that the liquid that's near the heater starts to rise. And that's because it's getting hot and hot fluids rise. And it's as easy to remember as something heats up and then something cools down. So as something heats up, it rises, it goes up. And as something becomes cold, it goes down, cool down. So again, real quick, looking at this convection cell, just want to make sure we hit all the main points. What you should know from that video is that the heater on the bottom is warming up the water and the hot water rises, pushing the cold water on top out of the way. The cold water is pushed down towards the heater. Then it is warmed by the heater. And once hot, that water starts to rise, continuing the cycle of movement. And this happens in air too. And this is actually what causes wind and air movement. So why does the water rise once it's hot? Why? Well, let me tell you. So because a liquid's density decreases as temperature increases, we see two balloons right here, and we see that the hotter balloon is above the cold balloon. That's because hot objects are less dense than cold objects. And so if you're less dense, that means you're going to be able to float better. And that's why the balloon with the hot water is floating and the colder balloon is sinking. Less dense objects float better than more dense objects. So we see because of this temperature difference, the density was changed and that allowed for the less dense hot water balloon to rise and the more dense cold water balloon to sink. So we see a change in elevation due to temperature and density. And we see that with the air. So the more dense air is cold and it has a higher pressure and wants to move to an area with less pressure, low density. You'll, we'll learn more about the, the pressure aspect in the next slide. But for now, just know that hot air rises and cold air sinks. And that's because as we know right now, because of the density. So here's an example of it happening on Earth. We see that if it's early in the morning, the land gets heated up by the sun, the air that's resting over that land also becomes hot. And then we see the hot air rises. As the hot air is rising, it's actually pushing out the cold air that was there before. The cold air starts to sink, and then eventually moves towards the land, becomes hot, and rises, sinks, rises, sinks, and that's wind. That's air movement that we're seeing right there. So let's talk about how density and pressure also play a part of this. So right here, we have some high density air. We know it's dense because the objects are really, really packed together. If we have all of these particles packed together, if we were at the bottom of this, that would be a lot of pressure on top of us, right? That's a lot of weight on top of us. So high density objects are actually under higher pressure. I shouldn't say objects, I mean higher density air is under higher pressure than low density air. So low density air is hot, right? And it's um, not under that much pressure. And as we can see, we know it's not under much pressure because nothing is really pushing these particles together, they're really spread out. Pressure pushes things closer together. So high density, cold objects, um, are really pushed together and they want to move away from each other. They want to spread out. So the cold air, the high density air, eventually um, moves to areas of low density, low pressure air. So I know that was kind of hard, that was a long explanation, but know that high pressure air wants to move to areas of lower pressure because it wants more space and that wind follows the movement of that air pressure. So let's kind of sum up what we've learned so far. So convection is the heating up of something by fluids, right? And air is a fluid. So when the sun heats up the air, that causes convection to start occurring because then that fluid air tries to heat up more air around it, beginning the movement process that we just learned about. So let's talk about that. So as we saw in the lava lamp, the same movement of lava happens in the air and water. We just talked about how air can move due to convection. 
So the liquids and gases heat up and then they cool down. As they heat up, as we said, they rise and as they cool down, they decrease in height. The different density molecules result in areas of high pressure and low pressure. And we force, we feel the force of these moving molecules as they're moving from areas of high to low pressure as wind. That's what wind is. It's air from high pressure trying to move to air to low pressure. And here's a photo of some more examples of how we see this on Earth. So we see the warm air is moving up into the sky and the cool air is coming down over the ocean and hitting you right here. Um, and then it actually kind of switches at night since the warm air is coming from the ocean and the cold air is coming from the land. Doesn't matter the direction, just know that warm air rises, cold air sinks, and that creates a circular movement which creates wind. <clears throat> so convection currents. So what we just talked about is called a convection current. When the convection, the heat transfer between air molecules cause the air to begin moving, then that's a convection current. And these actually impact the entire globe, not just the atmosphere, they also impact um, the ocean. They create trade winds, and we're gonna talk about trade winds. So trade winds are global winds that humans have relied on for centuries, and they are caused by those convection currents and also by something called the Coriolis effect. You might have heard of this in elementary school, um, but we're gonna learn about it in depth right now. So the Coriolis effect is a little, not complicated, but you do need to pay attention to understand it. Um, so take your time right now. Watch this video. I'm going to mute myself and let's see. He's going to explain the Coriolis effect a lot better and a lot more shorter, precise than I could. So let's hear what he has to say. The answer is not a resort. Good morning. My name is Lauren Lynch, and I'm a student at St. Petersburg High School, and I am in the AP Environmental class. My weather question is, what are trade winds? The answer is not a resort in, oh. in Tampa Bay, by the way. Here, well, <laughs> it is. I guess that's true. That that, 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 technically, that, 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 that is true. That's true. Uh, but he, here's, what, here's what she's talking about. All right, the trade winds. Let's talk about this. The global scale here, some, uh, some earth wind circulations here. We're talking about 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south, those latitudes there. And then we've got the equator. So we've talked about this before, how wind blows from high pressure to low pressure. There's a natural occurring area of high pressure right along 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So wind blows from high to low pressure. At the equator, there's a constant area of low pressure. And so you have these winds blowing from high to low, but because the Earth spins on its axis, the Coriolis force forms or the Coriolis effect and that causes this apparent force for those winds to slant in the northern hemisphere they curve to the right in the southern hemisphere they curve to the left and that's what creates those easterly winds from 30 degrees north to the equator you have the winds slanting to the west and we call those the easterlies because the winds blow from east to west so let's talk about why this is called trade winds back in the early centuries this helped ships navigate across the Atlantic from east to west and the origin of the word trade is track or route. So the Portuguese actually recognized how important this was in transiting across the Atlantic Ocean to more efficiently and quickly get across to help with the trades and still even today they use those easterly winds or those trade winds to get ships across the Atlantic. So as you saw, air, as we said, moves from high pressure to low pressure. There's a low pressure zone in the middle of the Earth, the equator. So the high pressure at the top always is going to go towards the middle. And so you constantly have air going like this in this direction towards the equator of the Earth. But because we spin, it also begins to spin too. So the air that's going this way starts to spin that way. And that's exactly what he said causes these winds. And that is because of the Coriolis effect. Good morning. Good morning. So Coriolis effect basically is caused by the Earth spinning. Let's see how that actually makes hurricanes spin.
what's going on here? Every time I throw the ball straight, it seems to bend to the side. No matter what I throw, no matter how straight I throw it, the ball seems to be curving. Maybe it has something to do with this. That whole time I was spinning, which is why it looks like I'm about to puke. That curve is created by the Coriolis effect. You may have heard that it makes water in the bathtub spiral down the drain a certain way, or that it determines the way a toilet flushes. That's actually wrong. Those are not caused by the Coriolis effect. But the Coriolis effect is what makes hurricanes spin, and it's the reason why Jupiter's great red spot is spinning the way that it is. So what is the Coriolis effect? Well, it's what happens when objects moving in a straight line appear to curve because you are rotating. And it affects all kinds of things. It bends the paths of missiles and sniper shots. But how does it work and how does it create hurricanes? Right now, it seems like the ball's curving, but let's take a look at what's really happening. My friends and I put together this little experiment using a sort of spinning seesaw. Here, the camera's standing still. It's just hanging from the ceiling. And watch what happens. From the moment the ball leaves my hand, it's just going straight. Let's watch that again, frame by frame. Keep your eye on the ball. You can see it travels in a perfectly straight line. But what if you're spinning with the seesaw? Look at what happens when you rotate the footage so the seesaw stays sideways and everything moves around it. Now let's follow the path of the ball again, but from this new perspective. The trajectory looks completely different. Now let's watch this one frame by frame. From this rotating perspective, it totally looks like the ball is curving. That's crazy because you already saw that exact same throw. Watch it again on the left. The ball is going straight, but on the right, when you're rotating with the seesaw, the ball really looks like it's curving. You might be thinking, why should I care? I don't spend a lot of time on a spinning seesaw or on a merry-go-round, but you kind of are on a merry-go-round. The earth is constantly spinning. Have you ever seen someone in a movie making fine adjustments on their gun? Well, one effect they're correcting for is the Coriolis effect. The longest sniper shot, which was over 3,000 yards, would have had to correct for a one-foot deviation due to the Coriolis effect. So how does the Coriolis effect create hurricanes? Hurricanes form when air rushes from all directions into a low pressure region. So imagine there's a low pressure region between the two of us. Air is going to rush toward the center. Let's see what that looks like from space, from our camera that's hanging from the ceiling. It's not spinning, so the air, or in this case the balls, are clearly going in a straight line. But if you're rotating with the Earth, or with the seesaw, you'll see the air bend to the right. In the northern hemisphere, this creates hurricanes with counterclockwise spirals. In the southern hemisphere, it does the opposite. It creates hurricanes with clockwise spirals. This storm on Jupiter, which is actually bigger than the Earth itself, has been spinning for at least 200 years, largely due to the Coriolis effect. So when you're in a rotating frame, the Coriolis effect seems to exert a very real force All right, so I hope that video cleared up the Coriolis effect even more. Really liked his example with the seesaw, helping me understand it a lot more as well. Um, isn't that interesting? I had before, like I said, this is my first, not my first, but one of my first times diving into weather and air pressure and how the winds are created by the sun and everything. Um, and I thought this video helped me understand it. So I hope it made, I hope it helped you understand it as well. So, convection currents. We just saw how they help create winds via the sun, um, heating up the air, causing convection currents. Also, the wind is um, 
helped out by the Coriolis effect like we just saw. So let's see how conven convection also impacts ocean currents. Think about ocean currents like the winds of the ocean. You ever stuck your hand into the sea and felt it started, the, the water was moving? Or you ever go to the beach and you're playing in front of your towels and stuff and then you look back up like 20 minutes later and you're way down the beach? That's because of the current. The current pushed you. It's like water wind in a way, kind of. And, and they are also caused by convection. So all of these different currents drive heat energy throughout the Earth, and they actually help keep the Earth's climate relatively stable over time. Um, and that's like the wind, the ocean currents, they all contribute to keeping Earth's climate relatively stable, and they help transfer energy in the heat all throughout Earth. So let's watch this final video, and let's see how ocean currents are created by convection. Real quick, just want to let you all know what he just said is the Coriolis effect, the reason why those winds um, start rotating where he just said they are is because the Earth is spinning and the Coriolis effect is producing those clockwise and counterclockwise rotations in each hemisphere creating the wind that makes the ocean current. All right, let's continue. me again. So what he just said, how the ocean holds more heat than air does, and the currents push that heat around the ocean, as I mentioned earlier, that plays a huge role in controlling Earth's climate, and it helps 
all the oceans stay warm and distribute that warmth throughout the Earth. All right, so that ends today's lesson. You just learned basically what creates Earth's winds and what creates ocean's currents. Um, and it's important to remember that the sun is what gives us the heat needed to power the convection that runs these winds and currents. So in this video, you should have found all the answers to that Google form that you should have been completing. Um, yeah, and Tomorrow, Wednesday, we will have in-person school. Um, we're probably going to be working on our study guide for the Unit 4 test because we will be taking the Unit 4 test by um, this Friday. So get ready to start studying. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.